Thank you, dear chair. Thanks, Madame Lagarde. So we are facing a spike in inflation in the euro area. So we all means politicians, economists, as well as citizens discuss what the best monetary policy actions should be at this stage. So as Greens, we strongly support the ECB's decision to keep financing conditions favorable. And this takes place at a time when an elevated rate of inflation is primar primarily driven by higher energy costs. You were mentioning it before. So an inflation reflects as well a temporary rebound after months of deflationary trends and economic downturn due to the pandemic. Additionally, the high prices are largely driven by supply restrictions on energy, a field where the monetary policy impact is limited. So we believe that a premature withdrawal of accommodative monetary policy and rising interest rates sharply would be just bad for the recovery and employment rates, as you mentioned before as well. So it's important not to make the same mistake as in 2011, when the ECB raised interest rates too early in the sovereign debt crisis, thereby increasing borrowing costs, slowing economic growth, and increasing unemployment when exactly the opposite was needed. So could you please elaborate, dear Madame Lagarde, what elements point to an inflation decreasing by the end of this year, thereby justifying the current monetary policy stance? And what is the ECB doing to counter the current concerns in some member states that inflation might be there to stay? Thank you. So concerning inflation, um, as I said in my introductory statement, um, risk to our inflation projections is tilted to the upside, particularly in the near term. And this is something that we have to take into account, that we have taken into account in our monetary policy communication last Thursday, and that we will continue to observe, particularly in our March and then later June and September um, monetary policy meetings when we receive the projections that are produced by, by staff. And we obviously have to take those numbers of December and January that were surprisingly high and surprised the worst for all. We have to take those numbers into account in order to uh, identify the path towards uh, medium uh, term outlook inflation, which is one of the conditions that we look at in order to uh, take monetary policy decisions going forward, as this is part of our forward guidance. Now, with having said that, I also identified clearly, uh, especially in the uh, statement that I uh, gave you in my opening remarks, that inflation uh, and the current circumstances uh, can have a twofold effects given the drivers behind inflation. You know, what is, what is behind inflation numbers and the particularly high inflation numbers? It's largely more than 50% energy prices driven. It is supply uh, driven and the bottlenecks are playing a critical role in that respect. So that can have a twofold impact. One is it can push prices up and tilt it to the upside, and that's what we are seeing for the, uh, for particularly in the near term. But it can also have a dampening effect uh, on consumption and on investment because it squeezes the income uh, that is available, and as a result, would have an impact on, uh, would have a, a downside impact on uh, both growth and inflation. And this is precisely that twofold impact that we have to unpack, if you will. Uh, to uh, define our medium-term inflation outlook, which is critical for the purpose of our forward guidance. And that's what we will be doing in the next uh, Monetary Policy Governing Council meetings when we have projections. The first one will be in March and will give us a chance to assess uh, the, uh, the sustainability of uh, those inflation push that we are seeing. But for the moment, let me remind you that we are not seeing any de-anchoring of inflation expectations to the upside. We are seeing a, a, a degree of re-anchoring, if you will. In other words, we're covering the ground towards target, but we are not seeing any de-anchoring to the upside. Thank you.